Hey, what's going on guys? Hey, welcome to Greenhouse. My name is Mike and I am the Next Gen Pastor and I'm excited to be able to bring the word this morning. Uh, we are in a series called Live Green, uh, The Essentials of Discipleship, and it's based around our mission. We exist to help ordinary people become passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And we created this series because even though our pursuit is to make disciples, uh, there are probably some of you that don't know how. And so uh, last week, Pastor Matt came in and he started the bridge uh, talking about teaching and, and there was this idea of how to make a disciple. One ingredient is teaching. And today I'm going to pick off and I'm going to talk about baptism. And uh, the title of this series or even this sermon is called The Hardest Part of Discipleship because uh, even though we might see baptism as just like, you know, uh, dunking someone in water, what Jesus had in mind was so much more. So if you're standing up with me, we're going to be in Matthew 28, uh, starting in verse 18. And it goes like this. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Jesus, help. Amen. Hey, go ahead and high five your neighbor and say, let's do this. I don't know if you've ever realized this, but stories, they matter. Like look at your neighbor and say, stories matter. Um, I don't know if maybe this is you or maybe the person around you, but when I was thinking about stories, I couldn't help but uh, think about the people that try to finish your stories. I mean, this isn't uh, something that you've asked for. Uh, this is not, not something that you always ask for help in, uh, but there may be people around you that can't help but help in fi helping you finish uh, those stories. And so when I was thinking about this, I thought about two groups of people. Uh, the first group um, is what I would call uh, the momentum stealer, okay? Like this is the person or I was going to say the climax stiller, but that kind of sounded weird. Uh, but this person here um, is the person that allows you to tell the beginning parts of the story, right? Like they're, they're following you. They're nodding their head. Um, they're with you. But the moment you get to like the exciting parts, the moments where you get to uh, the part where it's not the intro and the characters in the setting and you get to the kind of like the climax of the story, right? Like they kind of automatically jump in and finish the part that you were so looking forward to, uh, to to saying, right? And then you look at them and you're like, oh, hey, hey, what's going on, man? Like, why would you do this? And their excuse every single time is you weren't telling the story right, all right? So that's number one. Number two, stories matter, is, um, is, is what I would call the see what had happened was type of person, all right? Um, and, and this is the person where maybe you went on, a, on an adventure together, maybe you went on vacation together, um, and you have this moment where you experience something together, and you're telling the story to someone on the outside that doesn't necessarily see the same story as you. And so you start telling this story, and you're getting, you know, kind of breaking down the parts, and the person's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they're looking at you intently. They're kind of looking at you kind of like they're like a, like a story police or something like that. And, and they're waiting, and they won't necessarily always tell you this, but they're waiting for you to go down an aisle of untruthfulness or uh, to tell a version of the story that they didn't necessarily see themselves. And so what's funny is, is that you're telling this story and um, you see them kind of interjecting and they'll say something like, see what had happened was or actually what happened. Or my wife and I, we would say something along the lines of, no, 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 what had actually happened. Right. And so it starts off pretty funny. We're like, ha, ha, ha. We're laughing. And you're kind of putting on that fake smile. But by the end of this storytelling, you are looking at each other and you want to run each other's necks. Why? I, I think it's part of this mechanism for humanity that deep down inside all of us, you and I, we desire to tell the most accurate story. And so when, when I think about this why, the why of where we're going with discipleship is because stories matter. Not only do stories matter, but it's our understanding of these stories that is going to shape how we feel and how we feel is going to shape how we see. And ultimately how we see is going to shape the things of how we live and believe. 
Friends, this is so important to where we're going with discipleship, because I don't know if you could tell, but we live in a world around us where our friends and our loved ones and our co-workers are telling a story about who God is. They're asking questions or telling stories about if God exists and if he's real and if he's for them. They're defining uh, if he's for them. He's the, they're defining like, man, what does God what does God think about the pandemic? Can God be real if he allows X, Y and Z? Which is why, for those that follow Jesus, the greatest honor and mission on this planet is to help people understand the right story about God. See, stories matter. See, see, what does the person around you believe about God, his heart for humanity, his plan for salvation? What do they think and what's your responsibility to this? See, today we're talking about discipleship. Look, your neighbor say discipleship. <laughs> all right, let's dive in. All right. So if you're taking notes, number one, the question we got to define is what is discipleship? It's funny because when we look at our church and we look at the contemporary Christian circle, a lot of us will define uh, discipleship like this evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism in some ways represents those on the outside that have yet to know Jesus. And then we say discipleship is geared towards those that are in the church and it is reserved for those who already are following Jesus. Right. This discipleship. I remember uh, I was I was in a staff meeting with Tom Brenneman, who was one of our pastors. I just jumped on staff and Pastor Mike was talking on discipleship and and, and Tom kind of raises his hand. He's like, hey, Pastor Mike, I got a question. He says he says this. He says, Mike, now when, when you're talking about discipleship, you're not talking about Christian improvement or are you? And Pastor Mike says, no, 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 not, not at all. But it's what people think. And I remember there like sitting like my mind blown, blown because if if you're like me growing up, when we hear the word discipleship, it felt more like an insider's track to more Bible studies, to more micro churches, to more core groups. You name it. Like that's what kind of like discipleship meant. But as we look at scripture, Jesus defines discipleship so differently. In Matthew 28, he says this. He says, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Disciples. Say that with me. Go and make disciples. How? Teaching to reserve, which is what we talked about last week. But here's the other part. Baptizing. See, teaching is the process of discipleship that continues after they're convinced of their need of Jesus. But what Jesus would say is baptizing is the process of discipleship that starts before they're convinced of their need of Jesus. So mind blowing, because I think a lot of times we just looked at baptism. Baptism is something that that was just like an ordinance to follow after following Jesus. But listen, when we look at baptizing, it was a part of this evangelistic strategy to go and to immerse a culture in the ways of Jesus, even before they think they need it. By the way, this is exactly what they did once Jesus went away in Acts 14. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see it on the screen. It says when they had preached the gospel, they had made many disciples and then they returned to their their homelands. And in 22, it says this. It says they strengthening the souls of the disciple, encouraging them to continue the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Look at how the early church applied the Great Commission of Jesus and describe what they were doing. When we look at this verse, it breaks down. It says that, number one, that they were making disciples. (laughs) <laughs> which looks a lot like in this passage, like evangelism. But no, no, like they were actually making and baptizing new disciples. Right. But then the second part, it says that they were strengthening disciples, which is, looks a lot kind of like what we call discipleship nowadays in our church. It's, it's funny because uh, there's a story of a pastor that goes to his daughter and he tells his daughter like these simple instructions. Daughter, go clean your room. And so she, he goes away for a little bit and leaves the daughter to do what she does. And, she, and, and, the, and the pastor comes back a little later, like probably three or four hours later and says, hey, did you clean your room? And this is what the daughter says. The daughter says, no, you know, I, I heard you say uh, for me to clean my room. And so, you know what I did? I, I got together with a small group and we, we kind of analyzed all the ways that we should clean our room. 
And the, the, the father's like, but, but I told you to go clean your room. He's like, no, I, I get that, Dad. But, you know, we got together and we started to create songs of like clean up, clean up everybody. And we, we started kind of clean up and kind of, you know, singing songs and, and praises to, to the clean your up God. Right. You know, like we started doing that. He's like, no, but I told you to clean your room. He's like, no, I, I, I get that. But but, you know, we, we kind of like, you know, we we looked at we opened up the, the Bible and we started to you know look at how like what those words and how they break down in the Greek. And we want to really understand like, man, what does this actually mean at the, the root meaning? What does this word actually mean? Clean your room in the in the Greek clean means. And, you know, and, you know, you see like the, the story goes on and on. But then the dad looks at the, the girl and says, I, I get all these things. But 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 did you go and clean your room? See, I, I think the, the tragedy is that we focus so much on the teaching side of things, which is not bad. We're going to strengthen Jesus. We're going to strengthen people in the Lord, and we're going to grow people to love him. But Jesus said, go and make disciples, not just improve existing disciples. See, followers of Jesus, we have a shot to tell the story. See, we have a story that when receives breaks chains. We have a story that when receives frees people from their addiction. We have a story that when receives restores brokenness in marriage. We have a story which is when it, when it was, when it's received brings heaven to earth and friends. We have a gospel that says when our stories, even though they might be broken and fractured and, and to its end, when it meets up with God's story every single time, it becomes a beautiful story. But according to Jesus, Disciples don't just happen. According to Jesus, you don't find them, you make them. What are you saying, Mike? What I'm saying is, is that if we actually want to make disciples the way Jesus asks us to make disciples, then you got to understand that you're not really making disciples unless you're making new disciples. Well, Mike, <laughs> I hear that, you know, but, but I'm not an evangelist. I don't, I, I'm not good at this. Listen to me. <laughs> We, we don't go to someone that is prophetic and say, hey, man, uh, OK, you might not be prophetic. So that means you don't have to pray. And we don't go to the person that says, hey, I don't feel like a teacher. I don't feel like I'm a teacher. So, you know what? You don't got to read your Bible, you know, right? Like you might not necessarily be an evangelist, but you are called to be a disciple maker, which means we teach and we baptize. Which brings me to question number two. When does this process begin? And here's. What I would say about this process, I believe according to what Jesus is saying, it begins the moment it becomes good news to you. I don't know if you have any foodies out there. Um, if, if Greenhouse Tampa, Darren and Danessa, if you're watching this, I know you're a foodie. You have an Instagram to prove it. Right. But for those of us who love food, uh, man, we 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 will just tell the world about our good experiences. Right. And so we'll go to a restaurant and, and we'll have a have a good meal. And after that meal, we can't help but tell friends. We can't help but post it on our Instagram. We can't help but, you know, make food blogs if you're Danessa and Darren. But listen, no one after a good experience of, 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 of at a restaurant goes back and discusses this with their spouse and says, you know what? That was such a good experience. Oh, man, before we tell anyone, we got to make sure we're experts at this restaurant. Like no one says that, right? The moment we have a great experience, we can't help but share it. Uh, Pastor Mike um, <laughs> and Pastor Brooke always talked about like this pickle game. I was on vacation and I hear the statement where Pastor Mike's like, hey, you know, I thought pickleball was for old people. But, uh, you know, one of the top you know, players in Gainesville is Mike. And I was like, oh, man, like, thanks, Mike. I <laughs> kind of wish you said basketball was something more uh, competitive. Uh, but, man, I, I truly love pickleball. How did it start? Well, I went out to a pickleball court and I was intending to play tennis, but there was a group that said, hey, try this sport out. And at the end of it, I fell in love with it. And because I loved it, I couldn't help but share it. See, here's the thing. If you're if you're experiencing something valuable and worthwhile, you share it. See, we are disciple makers by nature. It's funny because like before your kid is born, you've already painted their room with gator colors and you you have like the white noise as like the dun, da, 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 go gators. Right. It, you know, before before a kid touches a basketball you're telling them about your favorite heroes right like there's something about us that are disciple makers before we even think we are we are disciple makers by nature see when it comes to discipleship and the when to share it here's what I want you to write down when do we share the gospel as soon as it becomes good news to you you share it what's the principle in this 
as soon as it becomes good news to you, share it. Mark 16, 15 says, and then he told them, go into all the world and to preach this good news to everyone. And in Romans 10, 13 through 14, it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him unless they if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? See, we have to. Our responsibility is to help people get the story right. See, the moment the gospel becomes good news to you, maybe uh, maybe you just gave your life to the Lord a week ago. Maybe it was last night. Maybe it's today. The moment the gospel becomes good news to you, what we do with discipleship is we share it. We share it. See, discipleship is all about intentionality and real relationships with people who we really care about in our real lives. See, Christ has commissioned us. Church, the call to discipleship is not just that we live lives that demand an explanation, but that we speak lives so compelling that it demands an explanation. See, here's the thing. As he commissions us, this means this. If you're a doctor, you're no longer just a doctor, but you've been commissioned as God's representative in the medical field so that the medical field can see what God looks like when God helps hurting people. Right. If you're a lawyer, you're not just a lawyer, but you're God's representative in the courtroom so that the courtroom can see what God looks like when God tries a case. If you're a teacher, you're no longer just a teacher, but you are God's representative in the classroom so that the classroom gets to see what God looks like when he teaches a lesson. If you're a parent, you're not just a parent, but you are God's representative. You have been commissioned so that your family gets to see what God looks like when God loves and discipline those he loves. See, people are waiting to hear. People are willing to engage with people they trust, and that should be us. See, two things that make this practical. Number one is this, define your okos. In Greek, that just means household. Who's in your reach? Even right now, maybe you need to take 10 seconds and, and pull out a card and say, hey, these are the people that, that are in my reach. And this is not meant to be forceful. This is not necessarily, I'm not asking for you to get on a corner and just start screaming at everyone. What I love about Jesus is that Jesus did life with people. He would oftentimes go and have a meal with people. What I want you to do is I want you to think about like, man, the people that are, to you, that are in your life. And the formula that I, look, that I use is this, is that consistency in someone's life leads to trust. And once trust is built, leads to an opportunity to share the gospel. See, discipleship begins as soon as you care enough to share. Number two is this, is that not only do we define our okas, which is our, our household, or the people we're around, or the people that are influenced, but number two, we got to get really good at remembering our story, to remember who we were, and to tell people that you're not that way anymore. This is what we call our testimony. This week... My challenge for you is to think about what God has done in your life and to tell that story. See, here's the thing. When it comes to, to, to sharing the gospel, when it comes to following God's obedience in baptism and, and teaching, what I need you to know is that you're going to get rejected. There may be some relationships that will end, but the very things you're hated for are also the reasons why you were chosen. See, when does discipleship begin? It begins with teaching and baptism. And as soon as it comes good news to you, you share. Let me end it like this. We talked about the what of discipleship. We talked about the when of discipleship. And finally, just briefly, how do we actually live this thing out? See, what I know is that if you're in my reaches, that God is for you. He is not against you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. That because you follow Jesus, those that are in Christ, there is no longer any condemnation for those that he that he loves you, that you've been grafted as co-heirs with Christ, that 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 you have been chosen. You have a purpose. You have a venture. But here's the thing. Maybe some of you this morning, <laughs> you're in this hesitation because you're like, man, Mike, I, I go to church. I do all these different things. But, man, it's so hard for me to share the gospel. Now, I get for some of us that might be fears. But where I want to land today is that, man, have you actually asked the question? Has the gospel become good news to you? Because in order to share this good news, the gospel must become good news to you before it becomes good news through you. Let me say that again. If you're wondering like, man, how do I actually live this thing out? Here's the thing. The gospel must become good news to you before it becomes good news through you. 
And today I want to give you a chance to respond. Maybe you're in here today and, and you follow Jesus. My challenge for you today is to go make the complete package of disciples, to baptize and to teach, not just to just stay in our circles, but to go out to all the nations. I love this, this, this model of going because Jesus doesn't say just go, go and make disciples of people. He says go and make disciples of nations, which means in some ways what we're challenged to do is not just to make disciples of people, but we're also challenged to make uh, disciples of systems, which means where you go and where you work in, the influence that you have, bring God's kingdom to wherever you're at. But then there's a, another part of you guys where maybe um, you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus and your campus pastor is gonna, uh, gonna take over. And my challenge for you is today is the day to get baptized. Today is the day to be baptized. Jesus' solution is that we would go all in with him. Maybe you're here and you're struggling with addiction. Maybe you have sin habits. Maybe in this moment where you can't stop, you need to be made new. Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus alone saves you. But man, when you follow Jesus, you can't help but do what he says. And one of the, the, the first starts of obedience is to follow him through baptism. Let me end it like this. When we look at this word baptism, it, it actually, in the Greek, it, it refers to this word baptizo, which is used a lot in the dye making world. And so to kind of break this down, a dye maker would use this word because if someone came to you with a cloth and was gray, uh, they would say, hey, cloth, like our dye maker, would you dye this red? They would dip this gray cloth in the red dye and by it immersing together, it would come out and it would be red. This baptizo just means this immersion process. What, what I love about what Jesus is challenging us to do is that the same way that this cloth comes in and it comes back out entirely different. When you follow Jesus, when you make the step to follow Jesus, you go in with him and you come out completely different. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. That experience, it happens in following Jesus, but man, something just shifts when we choose to follow in obedience with baptism. But here's the last thing is that, man, what I love about what Jesus says is that, man, we go into all the nations baptizing, baptizing in the name, in the name. Say that with me, baptizing in the name. I, I love this name because it also, in some ways, you can say not just name, but you can say the reputation of the Father, the reputation of the Son, and the reputation of the Holy Spirit. What I know is that, man, maybe you've been like stuck or you've been stuck in your sin or, or maybe you have this block and you just can't feel how to get, get around. Here's the thing. Jesus has a great reputation. Jesus heals, he restores, and he sets free. But not only does Jesus have a reputation, what I also know is that your sin has a reputation. And I want you to even just think for a moment as I get ready to just pray us out. What has your sin done for you? What is the reputation of the thing that you're fighting with right now. And I'm gonna challenge you even today as I get ready to pray, that you would not only just accept Jesus as Lord, that you would recognize that there's nothing that can make you whole except for him, that it is only because of the grace of God that you're here, that you have breath, that he's giving you an opportunity to respond today. I'm challenging you today that maybe you would turn your reputation from your sin and you would choose to bask in the reputation of our, of our King and our Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is his reputation. That is available for you and is available now. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that God, the same way that we were baptized into your name, we were also baptized into your authority. We were also baptized into your family, your covering, your death and resurrection. And ultimately, Lord, we've been baptized into your grace. Lord, I pray, Lord, for new life. Could I pray that you, you would just allow people to experience new life, this new nature, this fresh start. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Take care.